Hello everyone. Uh, this is me again, Asam Filmi. Uh, I'm success partner with OBA Energy, and I will be your moderator in today's webinar. Uh, just uh, before starting our webinar today, I'd like to make sure that my voice is clear to all of you and that my screen is also clear to you. So please uh, type one or something in the chat box to make sure that you are okay with this. Thank you. Uh, so today's webinar is uh, a very interesting topic, actually. It's an uh, introduction to reservoir geomechanics and its applications by uh, our instructor engineer, Muhammad Omar. Before going to our interesting webinar today, I'd like to give you uh, a short presentation about OBA upcoming services plan for uh, this the coming quarter. Uh, first of all, this is our dashboard for OBA that represents our work till today. We are three teams. Uh, we, we have three teams in different con countries. Uh, we have uh, more than 40 next directors and in, 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 with different experiences. We have conducted uh, about 10 uh, knowledge bank. Uh, this is this is the knowledge. This is the number uh, 62. Uh, we have uh, attendees from all over the world, which is represented uh, in the down right uh, side of my screen. Uh, we have already conducted more than 30 courses in different softwares. Uh, uh, which what is important is our uh, uh, eight wave quarter live courses. That is shown on my screen. We have four interesting courses in the upcoming month: uh, water flooding design and optimization from the first from the first of uh, of May till uh, till the 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 fourth of, of uh, sorry uh, from the 29th of April to till the fourth of, of May. Uh, gas lift theory operation and the design uh, from the 13th of May till the 18th of May. We have also a course in advanced integrated formation evaluation uh, from 27th of uh, May till the end of the month, 31. Uh, and the last course in this wave is advanced will intervention operations, uh, which is uh, from 10th uh, of June till 15th uh, of June. Uh, we also have breaks in during these courses. Have one day break uh, day. Uh, during each of these courses, which is use days. Uh, here is uh, a QR code. You have uh, a minute to scan uh, this QR code for our upcoming courses to enroll in these courses. Uh, this is uh, our record of live courses that is available for, sa for sale as a recording of live courses. We have like 22 recorded courses in different uh, software applications and uh, interesting topics like uh, Pipesim, Techlog, uh, Petro, OFM, TrackCAD, and many interesting other software like GAP and uh, Embal, Sapphire. Uh, actually very interesting uh, software uh, courses, training courses uh, that include practical knowledge as well as uh, some inter interesting topics like Drilling a flow with the school, uh, perforation design, regular school intervention operation. Uh, this is also another uh, QR code that you can scan uh, if you'd like to purchase one or more of these courses and enjoy your big sale for sure. Uh, we, we also in OBA uh, provide mentorship programs where you can design your own uh, learning journey. Um, based on your availability and what you would like to learn. Uh, we have we have also this uh, website. I really I really encourage you all to visit our website to check the latest uh, uh, announcement and the courses that we offer through this website, uh, which is uh, a beautiful uh, website. Uh, this is a uh, gallery, uh, some of the pictures from the memories from internship programs that we conducted for uh, uh, different groups of students from Lebanon, uh, like Beirut Arab University, 
uh, that came here to Egypt to uh, get some technical knowledge and visit some interesting locations in Egypt. Uh, you just uh, need to uh, join us in one of these courses or internship programs to become one of our OBA ambassadors and enjoy that we provide for uh, our ambassadors, including discounts and many interesting other uh, learning opportunities. Uh, just before heading to our webinar today, I'd like to give you some uh, tips for this webinar. Uh, I have already muted all the microphones uh, and the camera uh, so that you all can get the best knowledge and the benefit from this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please keep your questions till the end of the webinar and uh, you can put your question in the chat box area and I will be happy to read your question to our instructor to answer it by the end of the webinar. Please, if you join this webinar using uh, uh, a name like iPhone or Galaxy or something like this, please uh, feel free to uh, rename yourself so that we can send you uh, a certificate of attendance, uh, attendance for this webinar. Uh, also, a note that we always give to you, certificates will be sent within one week from today. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce our uh, uh, instructor for today's webinar. Just one second. Uh, our, our instructor for this interesting topic is Engineer Muhammad Omar. Uh, engineer Muhammad is a reservoir engineer at uh, Anabetco, Amal Petroleum Company, with more than 10 years' experience in reservoir engineering. He currently uh, is occupying a reservoir engineering team lead position in South Abernema Petroleum Company. He holds a master's degree in science of petroleum engineering uh, from London South Bank University. His master thesis in, is in uh, uh, petrophysical analysis of shale sand cores using NMR, uh, which is nuclear mag magnetic resonance. He is currently a PhD student in uh, Faculty of Engineering, Cairo University. His PhD study is in, involved in uh, formulating new models for sand production prediction. Uh, his experience covers oil and gas condensate and wet and with gas reservoirs. He also has the ability to combine both conventional reservoir management and reservoir simulation work, uh, where, where both skills empowered by his knowledge of, use, uh, of using the different reservoir softwares uh, in different integrated reservoir studies in order to uh, put the different development plan. This is a short note about interesting instructor engineer Muhammad Omar. I believe helping me welcoming him. Uh, Engineer Mohammed, the mic is yours to start the webinar. Sorry for being uh, too long. Okay, thank you, Engineer Hassan, for this wonderful uh, introduction. Um, uh, I would like to welcome everyone for to this session. Uh, actually, I'm delighted to be here in cooperation with Online Petroleum Academy to have a small discussion about this interesting topic, introduction to reservoir geomechanics and its applications. Reservoir geomechanics has been the core of study for several years recently and has been involved in the different sections in the oil and gas industry, as we will cover in the next few slides. Um, Yes, uh, okay, um, Engineer Hassan has introduced me uh, very well, so we'll skip this slide. Okay, uh, as we have just mentioned that uh, reservoir geomechanics has proved, proven its importance in many aspects of the, not only in petroleum engineering or oil and gas industry, uh, but it has also been used in different uh, uh, measures and uh, different uh, subjects like environmental sustainability and renewable energy, and also its applications. Uh, in, uh, as for petroleum engineering, as we are discussing, it has 
ensure uh, safe drilling conditions, uh, optimized drilling conditions, decreasing the uh, chances of loss of circulations, hole collapse, or, and uh, frac uh, fracturing the formations, increasing the well's productivity through hydraulic fracturing in case of unconventional reservoirs where we need to increase the productivity of the formation to gain uh, economic uh, production rate, okay? And ensuring uh, safe production conditions where we can predict uh, if there is a sand production and uh, what is uh, sand-free production uh, conditions, okay? Um, also, uh, reservoir geomechanics is used in the different uh, stages of the wells life and the different stages of the reservoir life and uh, uh, where different types of stresses is applied on the rock reservoir gene mechanics mainly deals with uh, stresses that acting on the rock and and we want to quantify or uh, we want to predict if the rock will uh, pair the uh, amount of stresses that is applied on the rock. So the strength of the rock determines whether the rock can handle the, those stresses or fail. And in case of failure, we want to know what to, what we can do to make sure that the rock will not fail. So we want to optimize the the drilling conditions, the production conditions, the injection conditions, so we don't have failure of the rock. Uh, on the other hand, if we are carrying out a hydraulic fracture operation for uh, for uh, enhancing the productivity of the wells and uh, creating uh, channels for production, we want to have a rock failure and we want to know how much we will gain from this. Uh, operation so we want to know how to optimize the, the fracture design so we can say that we can summarize that reservoir geomechanics uh, is not only applied in oil and gas industry but it, it has been uh, it has been its use it has expanded to be uh, to in different uh, um, engineering and uh, in different topics we can also mention that it uh, in, as for petroleum engineering or oil and gas industry it can be used in different disciplines and aspects of the uh, petroleum engineering okay we today will have a uh, a very short introduction about uh, reservoir geomechanics. So our contents for today will be the definition of what is reservoir geomechanics. And then we will talk about the stresses that is acting on the rock. Uh, okay. And then we will talk about the rock strengths and how we can determine the rock strengths and know what, how do we can mention and say this rock is more stronger than the other rock and which rock is stronger how we can quantify the strength of the rock then we will have a brief discussion about the application of reservoir geomechanics either in petroleum engineering or in uh, reservoir and energy uh, energy uh, energy generation and environmental sustainability okay uh geomechanics geomechanics is a combination of uh, two words okay and uh, what the first is geo which is a greek word meaning earth and the word called mechanics mechanics is a mass uh, is a science or which is dealing with forces, stresses, pressure, and uh, how to to know the effect of these uh, forces and stresses that is acting on any item. And actually, there are two branches for geomechanics. Okay, well, the first one is soil mechanics, 
which is deal with the rocks as a surface, and this is usually applied in civil engineering. And the other uh, branch which, uh, uh, which we are interested in is uh, rock mechanics. So rock mechanics is a, is a branch that is we deal with in petroleum engineering because it's dealing with the rocks below the surface. And uh, for um, making uh, simplifications, we use reservoir geomechanics instead of the world rock mechanics. So rock mechanics is the same as reservoir geomechanics. Okay. The rock is down deep in your uh, in your drilling section, or uh, the rock you are being drilled, or you are are you producing from the reservoir. There are three stresses that is acting on it: the overburden stress, and the maximum horizontal stress, and the minimum horizontal stress. Let us uh, illustrate what is the uh, overburden uh, stress. Overburden stress is the stress that is evolved due to the weight of the layers above. So if you are, if you are uh, studying uh, rock at the depths of like 1,000 feet, TV, uh, minus 1,000 feet TVD sub C. So what you want to know, what is the weight of the rock of the above that minus 1,000 TVD sub C. Okay, so Overburden is a stress that is evolved due to the weight of the layers above the point of your study. The weight of the of the rocks that is overlying the point of study of point of uh, interest is both uh, is both the weight of the matrix and the weight of the fluid. Okay, and you can compute the tendency of this uh, of these uh, weights from your density lock. Okay. And due to the overburden stress being applied on the rock, two different stresses are evolved, which is two horizontal stresses perpendicular to your overburden stress. Okay. And due to an isotrope and heterogeneity found in the rock, the two stresses will be unequal. Okay. And one is nominated as maximum horizontal stress, and the other is nominated as the minimum horizontal stress to determine which is the greater value of the uh, horizontal stress that being applied on the rock. Okay, and we can see that the three stresses are perpendicular to each other. Okay, <clears throat> according to the values of your uh, three stresses are being applied on the rock. We can determine the fault regime that is found in your in the area. There are three types of fault regimes. It's either normal fault regime, strike slip fault regime, or thrust faulting regime or inverse fault regime. Normal fault regime is found when your overburden stress. Is, is uh, greater than your maximum horizontal stress and uh, which is greater than the minimum horizontal stress. <coughs> and uh, when your normal fault regime, the body of your of the uh, underground is uh, is being pushed in the normal direction of the faulting. Okay. As for the inverse fault regime, which is going in the in the opposite direction you can find that the maximum horizontal stress is greater than your minimum horizontal stress and your is greater than uh, overburden stress, okay? It's just the inverse uh, of the normal fault regime. Uh, but in case you have the edge, uh, the maximum horizontal stress is the maximum and your minimum horizontal stress is the minimum acting stress on the rock, you will have what's, what's say uh, what is named strike slip fault regime, okay? And you can find that the surface is being moved and parted from each other, or from the surface. Ah, another point that we have to mention that the poor pressure is the, is the least value from, uh, from, 
when comparing the pool pressure from the stresses acting on the rock, it cannot exceed any of the stresses being applied on the rock. As we mentioned before, the overburden stress is the, uh, is the weight of the layers uh, uh, above the point of your study, okay? And uh, as we mentioned, it's just a direct linear equation in, uh, uh, in uh, terms of depth. And overburden stress is 0.052 and it's uh, multiplied by uh, the pulp density multiplied by the depth, okay? And the overburden stress gradient is almost one. On the other hand, the pool pressure gradient is around 0.44 psi per foot. Um, as for the horizontal, minimum horizontal stress, uh, we can estimate it from a leak of test or through equations, okay? And uh, the determining the minimum horizontal stress is, um, is very important to, to understand that we have to determine it to know what is the fracture pressure and what is the fracture uh, we cannot exceed it because if we exceed it, we'll have a fracture in, in your formation or in the rock you are being drilling. Okay. And the orientation of the minimum horizontal stress is perpendicular to, to, the, uh, to, to the drilling induced tensile fracture or, the, uh, or in case of you're doing a leak of test, you will, it will be perpendicular to the fracture propagation. Okay. On the, max, on the other hand, the maximum horizontal stress is estimated using equations only. Okay. So uh, there is two ways to estimate minimum horizontal stress, which is a leak of test or equations, but the maximum horizontal stress is only estimated using as uh, uh, using equation. Minimum horizontal stress will be perpendicular to the in drilling induced tensile fracture or the fracture propagation in case you have carried out fracture operation. Okay. But on the other hand, the uh, maximum horizontal stress will be perpendicular to what is called poor hole breakouts. Uh, and we will cover how we can estimate them from the logs. But first of all, we have to uh, carry out, uh, illustrate what is the leak of test, okay, or formation integrity test, okay? Leak of test is, is carried out through pumping fluid into the well where the volume uh, versus pressure is monitored. In the first period, okay, you will have the pressure increasing direct, uh, 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 directly proportional and linearly with time and, uh, and volume, okay? As you pump more vol uh, volume, you will have more pressure. It's a linear relationship, okay? Okay. Is it showing now? Yes, yes, your screen is, is clear. So in the first period, as we mentioned, that the pressure is increasing linearly, okay? Uh, with time and uh, volume being injected into the well pool. After a while, the relationship between the pressure and time deviates, uh, between the pressure and time deviates from the straight line, okay? And start deviating, okay? This is when you have leakage into your formation. Okay, well, where the, the flow starts to leak in information, that's why the relationships starts from deviating from straight line. Okay, and it but it continues increasing 
not in a linear way, but in a deviated way, until a sudden drop in the pressure you, you can notice. Before the sudden drop, we have reached what is called formation breakdown pressure. This is where the rock fa fails due to the pressure being applied on it. Okay, so you can you can you can you can see that the fluid being pumped has been invaded uh, has invaded the formation after the breakout of the of the rock. Okay. And this is when the tensile pressure uh, being applied on the rock has ex exceeded the rock strength and uh, caused the breakdown of the rock. Okay. After uh, the continuing pumping the fluid, okay, you you notice the pressure is being decreasing until it stabilizes and moves on in a straight line. This is where you have uh, the fracture propagates into your formation, okay, and extends. Okay, when the pump is shut down after uh, some propagation of fracture pr propagation, okay, uh, and if you shut down the pump, the pressure would decrease linearly until it reaches what is called fracture closer pressure. And you will notice that the pressure against time will decrease linearly, but in another slope, okay? So you're moving like that, you find the deviation from the slope you're moving, okay? Where you have reached, sorry, the point before is instantaneous shutting pressure, okay? And then the fracture closure, and then you will have another deviation, okay? So first of all, you have leakage, then you will have a fracture formation breakdown pressure, then you will have the fracture propagation pressure, then an instantaneous shutting pressure, and then the fracture closure pressure. Extending both lines will meet in a point which is called the minimum horizontal stress found in the rock. So through this test, you can determine the minimum horizontal stress. But how we can determine the direction of the of the stresses? Okay, we can determine the uh, the direction of the stresses by two ways. We can apply. We can use the caliper log. Okay, from the caliper log, we can find out. Uh, we can determine the breakdown, okay, uh, breakouts of the formation and the tensile fractures, okay, induced drilling tensile fractures, uh, or from the FMI log or ultrasonic logs, where we can determine the breakouts of the formation. Breakouts are usually large, and this is caused by the uh, that the uh, mud juice is not capable to handle the, to keep the, the well in uh, good conditions, okay? And there are, and uh, you will always find the breakouts in, in, in your hole, but massive break, breakouts in the hole can cause serious problems. So it's, to some extent you can accept some breakouts in the hole, but when it exceeds uh, limits, certain limits, and you you cannot accept it. Okay. So from the FMI, you can determine the, uh, the breakouts. You can see that the shaded or the dark color is a breakout, and uh, you can find out that it's 180 degree degree the, from each other. And you can find out the thin lines, which represents that induced drilling tensile fractures. Okay, and this is because the mud has caused a tension force on the tension pressure on the rock and caused small fracture in the rock. So you can find out 
these uh, two lines and you can find out that they are also 180 degrees from each other. And from the tensile fraction and the precals, they are, they are 90 degrees. So this is the direction of the tensile fraction is the direction of the SH maximum and the precals are found in the SH minimum. Okay, so in this way, you can find out precals are this way is the SH uh, sigma H, SH minimum and which is perpendicular to it is the um, maximum horizontal stress or what we can say sigma S, uh, sigma H, H sigma H maximum. Okay. Now we can illustrate what what happens to the rock when a stress is being applied on it, okay? In the beginning, you will have a nonlinear uh, relationship as we increase the stress and strain. Stress is forced, sorry, it's forced uh, to per unit area and strain is the deformation relationship is a unitless relation between the deformation and the uh, actual or original uh, lens okay so when you apply axial load on the rock or axial stress on the rock it will start shortening okay because uh, due to the ax uh, because the stress is acting on it and uh, by measuring the how much deformation the rock has ha, has uh, the stress has caused okay you can measure the strain and of course you are applying the stress so you know the stress you are being you are being, you are applying on the rock in the beginning you will have when you plot stress versus strain you will have this diagram Okay, in the beginning, you will notice that it's nonlinear relationship because the crack closing, because the post spacing closing and the, uh, the uh, compaction that can be uh, done in the rock. Okay, after the crack closing or uh, okay, uh, the closure of the crack, the stress increases uh, uh, versus strain in a linear, linear relationship. Okay, and the slope of this relation is called Young's modulus and is nominated as uh, in symbol E. So the symbol of the Young's modulus and the Young's modulus is one of the most important rock mechanical property. Okay. After a while, you will you will notice that the relationship deviates from the linear line. And this is, can we, we can say the end of the elastic uh, performance of the rock, okay? Because before, if you remove the stress, the rock, the rock can return back to its original properties or dimensions. But, after, uh, but in case you have applied like 40 megapack scale, Okay, so you're in terms of plastic deformation and damage. Okay, and the damage uh, cannot, uh, if you remove the stress being applied on the rock, the rock will not return to its original, uh, original dimensions because it has caused plastic damage. Okay, and the rock will continue is in, plast in the plastic performance until it fails. Okay, the response of stress versus strain uh, for for the rock varies from rock to another according the, to the rock property if it's tactile or brittle. Okay, a pretty rock will fail in very short time and will not allow per plastic per uh, response for the rock, okay? On the other hand, the tie rock will uh, show some of the plastic uh, response of the, uh, for the stress being applied on. 
and you can notice what is called necking. Okay, and necking means shortening at the point before a failure, before collapse of the rock at the point of collapse of failure. Okay, so we can say like it's a hard plastic. It's a prettle. If you have a hard plastic, no, uh, that is cannot be, uh, that fails very quickly. Okay, and for the prettle, it's like um, um, a dove. Okay, so a dove doesn't fail or doesn't uh, uh, deform uh, or collapse easily. You have to keep applying stresses on it. Okay, so we mentioned what is the stresses being applied and how the rock responds to the stresses applied on it. Now we discuss how we can measure the strength of the rock, how we can know the rock, this rock is stronger than the other. Okay, and how we can say, well, this rock is enough to withstand the stresses being applied on. There is a different lab tests that we can uh, perform on the rock to determine how the rock is uh, how the rock is strong. Okay. First of all, is the hydrostatic test. Okay, is applied when uh, two three perpendicular stresses applied on the rock. Okay, one is axial and two perpendicular on it, okay, in the horizontal direction. And uh, they are called confining stresses, okay? And the stress at which the rock fails is uh, uh, what we measure, okay? So for weak rocks, you will find that the rock will fail at very uh, low stress, while stronger rock will fail at much more higher stress. As for uniaxial, okay, is one of the most important tests that we apply. It's called uniaxial compulsive stress. It's applied when only un, uh, axial load or axial stress is applied on the rock, and the perpendicular stresses applied on the rock are zero. There is no axial, there is no confining stress applied on the rock. Okay, and uh, we keep increasing the axial load until we, until the point of failure of the rock, okay? And the, this, uh, the result, and this uh, stress, we, um, we mark it and we call it uh, UCS, okay? Uniaxial compressive strength, okay? Of unconfined compressive strength, okay? And this is uh, very important because we, with knowing the UCS of the front rocks, we can say which rock is more stronger than the other, okay? And uh, as UCS increases, means the rock is more stronger. The third test is triaxial compressive strength. Triaxial compressive stress is applied when three non-equal compressive stresses are applied, okay? And, uh, sorry, uh, S1, uh, S1 is greater than S2 and S3. So the axial stress applied on the rock is greater than the confining stresses because we have mentioned before that the perpendicular horizontal stresses is called confining, okay? So S1 is greater than the confining stresses applied on the rock, okay? And the other test is triaxial extension. It's the opposite of the triaxial compression, okay? You can find that is the confining stresses, okay, are less, are greater than the uh, axial load, okay? And triaxial extension, okay, is, uh, important for uh, fracture and design because you measure that tens tensile uh, strength of the rock. 
no, we are measuring actually, uh, we are measuring at which stress the rock will fail, okay? And it's mainly S1, okay? By capturing the value of S1, we can determine the strength of the rock because we will use it later to what we can say describe the rock strength. Okay, and we'll show it in the next slides. Okay, so here we measure S1. Okay, and to S1 we nominate it as what we call UCS. Okay. And then sigma one or S one, we can we measure it at different S three and S two. S three and S two are the same, so we call it S three. So we measure S one at different values for S three. As for the polyaxial, polyaxial compressive tens is a test is very expensive and is rarely used because it's high cost and complexity. Okay. The test is applied on a cupoy plug and three different stresses are applied on the rock, which is more realistic and which is more uh, closer to the what's happening in the real life. Okay. Is this slide clear? We can go through it again. Okay. Here, we measure what we call UCS, uniaxial compressive stress. Is the, is the point where the rock fails, okay? Here we measure S1 at different S3. For each S3, you'll find a different value for S1. This is the most important two tests that are being applied in a, for your rock or in the reservoir geomechanical studies. Okay. I hope it's clear now. As we just mentioned, sigma three is it's a confining stress. So sigma three is when it's zero. So breakdown, yeah. When the rock break down. You're welcome. So sigma three represents a test when you have uh, what we mean, what we can say uh, the uniaxial test. This one and. When, uh, when we uh, at this point, you can find that the UCS, the rock field, uh, when it reached 30 ki uh, kilo psi, and we can say as sigma three increase, the S one that has caused failure of the rock increases. Okay, so first when sigma three was zero, it was around 30. And when sigma three was 1000 B side was our say 37. When sigma three was like 5000 B side, it was around 55 or, or above. Okay. So as the confining stress acting on the rock increases, the S1 at which the rock fails increases. Okay. So uh, because what is the role of the confining stress? It's preserving the rock to handle the stress, the axial load that being applied on the rock. Okay. So sigma three, can, we can say sigma three is, uh, is a helping, is helping the rock to survive the axial load that being applied. So UCS is, is the minimum stress that, uh, that was uh, at which the rock will fail. Okay. So we can draw now 
what we can call is a more column envelope. And the more column envelope is a method that describes the rock strength. Okay. More, more column envelope, we can draw it by drawing these circles. Okay. Each half circle uh, intercepts the x axis at sigma three and sigma one at which for each test. So when sigma three was zero, the sigma one was UCS and you draw the half circle. Increasing the sigma three, you will have another, another stress at which the rock fails, okay? By having different circles at different conditions, at different sigma three, confining stress, you will have another point uh, that you can draw, you can draw the, you can predict, you can measure your sigma one, okay? For different half circles, when we we can, where for, uh, by drawing an envelope that tangent to the half circles, the different half circles, we can draw what we call a more column envelope, okay? Below it, the rock is safe and can handle the stress, okay? Above it, the rock will fail, okay? Um, for simplification, we can, um, because uh, to decrease the number of the lab tests being uh, 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 number of tests being used in the lab, okay, number of cores or plugs. We can do two tests. The first is the UCS or uniaxial compressive strength test, and when it's sigma three is zero and the uh, rock will fail as sigma one, which is the UCS. And another test we're applying like a confining stress, say uh, 1000 BSI and measure sigma one. And then we can draw a straight line and it will intercept the y axis at what we call cohesion. Okay, sigma node, C node, our S or S node. And the slope of this line is called coefficient of internal friction. By knowing these two parameters, we can compare between different rocks, okay? So for different rocks, we have different S node. And for each rock, we have different S node, depending on the deposition environment that, has, that the rock has been uh, has seen in its environmental deposition. Okay, according to the depths, according to the water, according if the rock has uh, suffered from perforation or acidizing, according to the uh, cementing material, each rock you will have different cohesion. Okay, and each rock will have different coefficient of internal friction. A weak rock will have low cohesion, low UCS and high internal friction, okay? So weak rock have low cohesion, low UCS, okay? But it will have high internal friction. Strong rock will have high cohesion, high UCS and low internal friction. When comparing between different, different rocks, we usually use cohesion or we can use UCS, we don't use internal friction. Why do we don't use it? Because most of the internal friction lies between one and 1.5. So small errors can give uh, improper results and improper decision, okay? But in the UCS or S note, you can see that the variation of numbers are, are in larger scale, okay? So now we can, we have seen what is geomechanics, mechanics, what is uh, stresses acting on the rock. 
and how we can measure the strength of the rock. <coughs> now we can we will discuss the applica main applications of the reservoir geomechanics. The applications of reservoir geomechanics cover the different stages of the reservoir life, starting from exploration, appraisal, development, and abandoned, and ending with abandoned of the well or reservoir. And it is also applied in the different disciplines of the of the petroleum engineering. Okay. So it's applied in, for production, engineering, reservoir studies, ge geological studies, it's applied in the drilling studies, okay, or the drilling optimization. And, uh, and it's also, uh, we can say, it's also applied outside the petroleum engineering. And it has, it's used uh, beyond the petroleum engineering has gained more reputation recently. We will have like a short discussion about some of the usage of the geomechanics. First of all, we'll start with the wall for stability. First of all, the role of the mud is to keep the hole in good condition, okay? Like this, but we never, we never obtain a hole like this, okay? We need a, hole, a good hole condition for casing, cementing, production, isolation, and we, to have a good hole condition, we have, should have a good choice of some mud type, weight, and rheology, okay? We carry out a whirlpool stability study to determine this, what we call a safe mud window, okay? The proper mud weight should be enough to avoid uh, fracture or, uh, or fracture of the what we uh, fracture of the formation being drilled, okay? And it should be uh, so it should be enough to avoid sorry breakout of the breakdown of the rock, okay? And not too large to cause fracture. Okay, we need it in this way. And we mentioned before, we can handle breakouts, but we, we should be above pool pressure to avoid kick, okay? Some cases we can go uh, below the pool pressure in case of underbalance, but we have to carry out several studies to ensure that we can handle any kicks that can be uh cost okay so we want to go and find out what is the stable mud window okay in the different sections you are being drilled okay the use of ge uh, geomechanical study okay the reservoir geomechanical study is a period to drilling operation has improved the drilling operations through decreasing of the cost of drilling. So now we know what is the optimum mud. We, we uh, decrease the amount of loss of circulation. We decrease the amount of stock. We decrease the amount of non-producing time. So we're decreasing the cost of the drilling operations. And we, if we can evaluate the feasibility of underplanced drilling, to estimate if it's uh, feasible and we can, and the whole will be, can be applicable for such formations being drilled. And we can optimize the casing design to avoid any fracture caused by the long hydro, uh, long column of the mud, of the mud will, uh, long column will cause fracture. We have to avoid it so we can optimize the casing design. As for the applications of res reservoir geomechanics and hydro fracture, uh, it's being uh, used for uh, tight or tight reservoirs, uh, either oil or gas, or unconventional reservoirs uh, like shale or shale gas. Okay. Uh, the number of wells that being produced are conventional reservoir exploration of conventional reservoirs. 
is being decreased uh, and uh, are very low this stage because most of the reservoirs are being uh, has been discovered and uh, uh, unconventional reservoirs has been targeted for many uh, companies, uh, especially abroad uh, in the uh, USA, Canada, uh, Russia. So what we uh, see and the development of new technology and uh, studies, we can economically produce from these types of reservoirs on conventional reservoirs, okay? Well, the hydraulic fracture is a technique where you apply pressure that causes, uh, where we, we can form channels inside the reservoirs that will connect the non-connected pool spaces, okay? And allow the flow from these pool spaces into your whirlpool. Okay, so hydraulic fracture is one of the methods for that is essential for producing non-conventional reservoirs, and the reservoir geomechanics is a is what is the main method for studying how to optimize the hydraulic fracture uh, design. Okay, some production prediction while completing the well. Uh, you have to make sure that the production conditions uh, for the rock uh, is optimized so you cannot produce sand. Sand can cause many problems to your well. But how does the rock fail? The rock fails, uh, uh, or how some production fails, it goes into by two phenomena, or three, you can say three. The first is a failure, mechanical failure of the rock. Okay, the rock doesn't uh, fail because it cannot bear the stresses acting on it. Okay, so the mechanical failure of the rock. Okay, afterwards, the production, you have, you should have hydraulic, okay, hydromechanical contention stresses acting on the rock in case of uh, hydraulic fracture. Hydrocraction. Some production or production uh, is compression. Okay. So the some production occurs through three uh, steps. First step is the mechanical failure of the rock due to the compression or compressive stress, compression stress applied on it. Okay, and the rock cannot handle this compression stress. Then hydromechanical failure of the uh, of the crashed rocks that has been failed from the rock and causing the, the fluid will carry out these particles into your whirlpool. According to the amount of flow, okay, and the viscosity of the fluid being uh, produced, you can have two ways, okay, either the, rock, the sand will fill up your perforation, okay, or either it will be reduced with the uh, uh, producing fluid, okay? So, so as we mentioned, that if you have a fill up and you, if you have a sand fill, you will have ineffective in perforations, okay? But what will happen if you have, like if the sand is being produced with your fluid, it will cause a major problem. So it will cause like erosion in your tubing, production tubing can cause erosion in your manifolds. Can reach, like here, it's like a surreal picture, okay, that occurred in uh, some of the fields. And it can cause several, another issue and another problem, which is uh, fill up in the gas oil separator planet. Okay, no separation. This is separator and it's filled up sand. Okay, it's compacted now. Another use for the uh, reservoir geomechanics is the carbon dioxide capture and storage. Carbon dioxide emissions from burning the fossil fuels has been uh, measured. Uh, problem, OK? 
as you can see, we can see the amount of greenhouse effect and how the climate has been changing recently. How is the sea and the water is being uh, extended worldwide? Okay. And this is why we are, the industry has been uh, interested in what we can call cap carbon dioxide, where we ca capture the carbon dioxide from the air to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide. And then we compress it and inject it one in a very deep reservoir of formations, okay, which is depleted, okay. To decrease the amount as the effect of carbon dioxide on the environment. Mechanical study for the CO2 injection should be carried out. Okay. We don't need to fracture the cap rock that is containing your carbon dioxide. So you should know the, the amount you can inject it, the rate, and the pressure. So you don't exceed um, uh, the amounts according to the results of the, the study you will carry out. Okay. And also CO2 enhanced and uh, enhanced oil recovery. A mechanical study should be done because of the same to have the same results, which is the amount, rate, and pressure you are being applied. Okay. Geothermal energy is uh, one of the leading uh, types of energy in, uh, nowadays, where we, you inject water inside a geothermal reservoir, okay, and produce it in uh, in the phase of vapor, and using the vapor you can generate electricity. So you, you, now we are trying to replace the fossil fuel and uh, ordinary uh, energy sources. To reach hard geothermal res reservoir, we must drill through a number of different formations and we are targeting uh, hard formations that can uh, pair the amount or the fluid you're injecting and the and the tips and pressure being applied so it doesn't fracture okay it should be under pressure okay so you can easily inject inside it so you don't apply a high injection pressure on it okay and uh, if it's highly fractured it will be easily because the highly fracture will have higher permeability so the injection should will be easy okay uh, so this is one of the main topics that being interested and it's very interesting topic nowadays. I would like to thank you for this uh, session and I would like to thank Engineer Sam for his time and I'm very happy to, that we have discussed this important topic about uh, reservoir gym mechanics through online petroleum academy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Muhammad, for sharing this interesting topic with us. Uh, please, everyone, I will send the feedback form in the chat box. Please take a moment to uh, fill in the feedback form. This will help us to improve uh, our performance in the upcoming webinars. I would like also to encourage you all to uh, attend our upcoming three webinars. Uh, now you have a moment to, to think about your questions and type it in the chat box in case you have one. Uh, so thanks again, Engineer Muhammad, for uh, sharing this interesting topic, uh, Reservoir Geomechanics, which is a very interesting topic and important one for the oil and gas industry because it helps to predict and mitigate risks associated with drilling, competition, and production. Uh, also, Reservoir Geomechanics is also uh, used to assess the integrity of wood bores and underground storage facilities, like you have mentioned, uh, carbon dioxide storage and disposal of waste uh, fluids. So thanks for, for thanks again for sharing this uh, interesting experience with us. Uh, again, everyone, uh, take a moment to fill the feedback form. And if you have a question, please 
Brobus in the checkbook, and uh, we will discuss on the Thank you. Thank you. Slide 12. Okay, one minute, please. Let's go back. This slide the stress being applied on the rock. Okay, the axial stress of being applied on the rock as it increases the amount of strain changes is a direct relationship. Okay. And it's a uh, uh, direct proportional with the strain. Thank you. Is it clear now? What does it mean, strain? Okay, strain means the amount of deformation, delta L above L, okay? It's delta L above L, how much the, the specimen will decrease, okay? To your original lens, this is strain. If the rock lens was like 10 centimeter and it's shortened to become eight, so your delta L is two. Two above 10 is 0.2. This is your strain. Here. Okay, no, uh, thank you. It's my pleasure. How to take sample from the rocks through plugging. Okay, you take a core plug, then you take a core, okay, and then you take plugs from the reservoir you want to test. Sir, so the mud weight at any section while drilling is based on some kind of data. Yes. From your, yeah, if you have uh, like what we say near wells, you know the formations you're going to drill and you know the strengths of these formations, okay? And you know which is uh, what we can say on uh, unconfined or uh, weak sand or hard sand, okay? Or hard rock or weak rock. If you don't have like a near wheel, uh, near 
well data you can depend on your seismic data seismic data can show you uh, the mechanical properties of the rock okay fracture propagation okay i'll just finish with them and then i'll go come on so if you don't have a near well where you can estimate the the uh, what is the formations you're going to go through and you don't have enough information about it okay you can depend on your seismic data seismic data seismic data will show you the mechanical properties of the rock okay and you can estimate the rock strength that which at which the rock will from these properties from your mechanical properties that you obtain from your seismic data because it depends on the compression waves and shear waves Um, Mr. Okanari, uh, okay, let's see. Mr. Okanari, uh, can you explain the friction propagation? Okay, one minute. What is most more easier to keep the, the fracture will propagate in the direction of the SH maximum? So the applied stress that being applied on the on the fracture created will be the minimum. Okay, that is causing the fracture to be closed. So always the fracture will propagate in the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. So the acting stress on on, a, on, on it will be the Minimum horizontal stress. The all increase. Uh, sorry, uh, Mohammed. Uh, is there a relation between overburden pressure and fracture pressure? They all increase with steps anyway. Okay. But you can find when you enter weak rock, you will find it in somehow in, uh, uh, you can find some of the rocks are having fracture pressure pre less than with uh, uh, the rocks above it. Okay, what is the difference between static and dynamic mechanical parameters? Why we should, why we should, we show dynamic for accuracy because you static doesn't take in consideration what what are you studying? Are you studying injection? Are you studying production? Are you studying uh, trailing? Okay. Uh, in in reality, the when the static, the rock isn't uh, the reservoir or it's a geomechanics. Our stresses are in uh, what we say equilibrium phase. Okay, so there is no change due to production, due to trailing. You are changing the stresses acting on the rock. And you're changing what we call effective stress. Effective stress is uh, due to the, in, in case of production because the effective stress is the stress applied minus the pull pressure. Okay, so when the pull pressure decreases, the effective stress increases. How choose? How we choose the fellow criteria depend on. Is, uh, I don't understand. NS, I don't understand what you're saying. Sorry. Well, how we choose the failure criteria to depend on? 
What those the things we calculated from here? Is there a relation between of a burden? We, we, I already answered that. Okay. With respect to CO2, how does Jim Cax detect work failure? Yeah. What happens when the rock are exposed? Sorry, I'm, I'm just. Uh, what, what happens when the rocks are, are exposed to tension stress? Tension uh, rocks fail under tension more easily than compression. Okay, they can handle compression. Stresses they don't really. They are not good in handling tension. They frack. This is the idea of fracking. Yeah? With respect to CO two storage, how does Jim mechanics? I Actually, um, I didn't go deeper in CO2 storage. Mr. Ayawu. So I don't know about it. I can answer it now. Could we run? No, you, have, you should have compression and shear waves, shear sonic waves. On compression, uh, shear sonic wave log is mandatory. Mr. Ahmed, or you can depend on your seismic data, okay, to have your mechanical properties. Unless you will depend on correlations on it, and it's not going to be. Uh, Abacus is a good one about the geomechanics and petroleum. It uses a finite element solution. It's a good software, Abacus. So, Engineer Muhammad? Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for answering these questions. Uh, unfortunately, we are gone out of time. Uh, so so we have to uh, close now. Uh, thanks, thanks again for answering these questions. And uh, everyone, thanks for joining us. And uh, we would like to encourage you to attend with us uh, next Tuesday. We have also another interesting webinar, which will be announced on our social media platform. So please, Keep an eye on our social media platforms, especially LinkedIn. We know about it, uh, our upcoming webinars. Uh, so thanks again, and see you all in next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.